Right. Hi, guys. It's Isaac. Um, back doing one of the A2 this time. Uh, kind of run throughs of one of the papers. I apologize. My voice might be a little bit croaky at times. Um, it's pretty cold here in Chicago. <laughs> and that's starting to hit. Today, we'll be going through the first uh, paper for the week, the Monday paper. Uh, it's a multiple choice paper. Paper code 970831 from May, June 2015. Um, Annabelle has sent me through a few questions um, that I'll try and focus specifically on. Um, hopefully, we'll get through all of them in time. Uh, but as I, as I normally do, just be running through the questions. And you don't get anything after this, feel free to kind of bring those up in, in a live session that will be run at some point by someone, uh, possibly me, possibly someone else. So let's get started. So question one, an economy reallocates resources and moves along its production possibility frontier. Um, it increases the production of necessity goods, reduces production of luxury goods. So basically we've got PPC, PPF, and necessity goods on one axis and luxury goods on the other. If the marginal utility of the additional necessity goods produced is greater than the marginal utility of consumers of the luxury goods the longer produced so, what we know here is that consumers get more out of an additional necessity good than the, they get out of a luxury good. And what is the effect on the economic efficiency of the society? What we're doing is we're moving along its production possibility frontier, increasing the production of necessity good and reducing the production of luxury goods. So production efficiency, remember we're on the productive possibility frontier, we're moving along it. Therefore, production efficiency is going to be unchanged. However, we're going to be more allocatively efficient because we're making more people better off because the marginal utility of a necessity good is better than marginal utility of a luxury good for all consumers of the economy. The answer is C. Question two, this is one of the ones Alabama wants to be focused on. Here we have a household spending all of its income on bananas and apples, and it can make the following purchases. Um, you've got bananas are sold at 250 and apples are sold at one. And then the utility is the, the extra unit of bananas. So the marginal utility of bananas is hot, uh, it gets twice as much to get double as the last unit of apples consumed. So, but here we can see that the prices don't match up. So if the prices were twice as large, we'd have a different fact. But imagine that um, apples give you one unit of utility. So you pay $1 for one unit of utility. Bananas give you double that, so $2, but you're paying $2.50 for that unit of utility. So per utility unit, as it were, apples are better value. So if you wanted to maximize your utility, you would decrease your consumption of bananas and increase your consumption of apples. So it's about kind of like efficiency. So here we're thinking about the amount of utility you gain from each kind of dollar spent, and we're trying to maximize that utility. So you could buy more apples and get more utility if you just spent your money on apples. Okay, moving through. So question three. Here we have a, a curve here, JK, in the diagram, and that's kind of a consumer's initial budget line. And the question is asking which combination would cause the budget line to shift to GH? So if the price of good Y, so we've got a situation here where they can purchase more of good Y and less of good X. So what we need is we need an increase in the price of good X here. That's what's going to shift them to kind of be able to buy less of it. But we also have to notice that they're able to buy more of um, stuff in general. Uh, they're able to consume more of uh, good Y despite the price not shifting. Uh, and therefore, what we know is that their consumer's money has to increase. So the reason we can shift to G is because even they're producing no X, they're able to produce more G. And we don't, the price of good Y hasn't changed. They can purchase more of it. So their income must have gone up. And here, if they were consuming none of Y, despite the fact their income's come up, they can only consume less. They can only consume H, not K of good X. So the price of good X has to have gone up. Question four. This is another one that was uh, asked to focus on. Here we have a diagram showing perfectly competitive firms' average production of labor and marginal production of labor. We've got the APL here and the marginal product of labor here. And the market price of the first product is $1. What we want to work out is which one is the demand curve. Now, we know that firms are going to produce at the point at which marginal productivity of labor is less than average productivity of labor. That's a fact. So we know that the demand curve is always represented by the area of the marginal productivity of labor curve that exists below the average productivity of labor curve. So the demand curve for labor is represented by K and L. Five. So that's just a rule. Sorry, to explain that, that's just a rule that you need to know that uh, a demand for labor curve is the price of the market firm for the price product doesn't really matter. Demand curve for labor is always below, where the NPL is below 
the APL. Question five. Here, the table shows the main characteristics of employment into alternative occupations. Um, what we have here is we've got kind of average annual wage going on, all these different factors. Well, so what can we definitely deduce? Can we deduce that occupation Y has greater non-financial advantages than occupation X? Well, looking, you can see that key kind of these are the non-financial advantages where they've got high job security versus low job security, but you've got more. Holiday, annual leave and occupation X, not clear, clearly. There'll be more competition placed on training courses to enter occupation X and occupation Y. We can't really deduce that. Uh, we don't know what people's preferences are. Those who choose occupation X attach more importance to lesser activities than those who choose occupation Y. Well, here they've got more time off. Their working week is less. Uh, they've got lower job security and they're earning less. So here we can suggest that they really prefer working. Uh, they don't attach that much importance to lesser activities. They like the high job security and they prefer this $100,000 um, wage, the $80,000 wage. They've got less holiday they have to work harder. We can assume and deduce that the people who choose occupation X attach more importance to leisure activities because that's the trade-off. The opportunity cost of choosing occupation Y is these five less weeks holiday that you could have got choosing occupation X. Question six, again a question that someone wanted to go to. Um, a trade union seeks to increase the wages a firm pays to its workers while at the same time preserving jobs. What will here strengthen the union's negotiating position? So we want to think, what does uh, make labour more difficult to fire? What means that uh, the union have more power in terms of negotiating with a firm? The reason it's D here, the trade union operates in a monopsonistic labour market. Well, what's a monopsonistic labour market? It's so where there's only one seller. There's only one supplier of labour and the labour supply only comes from that trade union. And that trade union has a lot of power negotiating because the firms who they're negotiating with have no choice where they're going to go. If, you're, if the trade union says you've got to pay our workers double and the firm goes no, when the union just goes, well, you can't have our workers then, and the firm has no labour. So where there's a single kind of supplier of labour, a monopsonistic labour market, the, firm, the trade union therefore has a lot of power. Um, I hope that was a kind of sufficient explanation. Question seven. When a firm increases all its output by 300%, its output increases by 400%. Or does it illustrate, well, this economies of scale are where is the size of your production of your output increases, you have higher costs. That is clearly not the case here because we're increasing all its inputs, but we're getting a greater than that output. Well, here we've got increasing returns to scale clearly because when we're increasing all its outputs by 300%, we're getting even more return, we're getting even more output. So it's clearly an example of increasing returns to scale there. Quite a simple question. Right, question eight was something that I, I was asked to focus on. So here we've got some average variable costs of a firm, and we know that they're constant over this relative range of output. We're going to assume that the fixed costs are incurred. Which curve in the diagram could be the firm's average total cost curve? So fixed costs we know um, are just going to be fixed. We know that the average variable cost is going to be constant. What we know, therefore, is that, that our curve, our average total cost curve, is always going to exist at some point. So there's always going to be a cost when you're producing no output or minimal output. But as you go down, and because average variable cost is fixed, you're going to start splitting those costs amongst more and more units. So your fixed costs are going to be dissipated. And eventually, we're just going to get to the point where the fixed costs are shared out more and more and more. And the only thing left is going to be this average cost here, pretty or just above average cost. <laughs> so we're going to get kind of an exponential relationship where the curve is decreasing, decreasing until it's starting to flatten out as you get more and more output. That's something I'm happy to go over in person, more in the um, in the live session. It's something that's a little bit complicated. What's important here is to notice that fixed cost always means you're going to have some cost at the beginning. So it's got to be starting from high and downward sloping because you're spreading those fixed costs out as you're increasing output. Which is an example of an external diseconomy of scale? Question nine. Well, an external diseconomy of scale is something that happens in kind of like an area where you have a lot of firms. So if you imagine a city where you have loads of firms using it, moving in, an economy of scale might be where well, you can share infrastructure, you've got cube networks, etc. A problem, well, an external this economy of scale might be you get increased traffic congestion. If you have loads of firms moving into an area or growth of business in an area, as industries expand, you get increased traffic congestion, that's going to be a problem. Question 10, again, something that someone wants me to go through. What makes it easier here for a firm to compete against large firms in the small industry? Well, when we have a small firm competing, we want them to be able to kind of like 
provide some specificity. We want them to be able to provide something niche in the market. And Annabelle asked if this is the case, and it's exactly the case, that a smaller firm needs some degree of product differentiation if it's going to survive. If it's just one product in the market, let's say Coke, a small company trying to sell its own cola isn't going to do very well because essentially the products are the same. Um, what we're tr- what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find something where there's a little bit of differentiation demanded. So sometimes demand, uh, customers demand kind of more high tech products or softer quilts. So I don't know whatever kind of product you're thinking. So I was just looking at a quilt on my sofa here. Uh, any product that speci- has a great de- degree of specificity to it. It's going to be easier to have smaller firms competing against them because they can fill that kind of niche in the market. So, Annabelle, you're exactly right there to keep out niche markets. Question 11. The diagram here shows the firm's annual um, revenue curve. So it's AR curve here. And we have a situation where the firm is currently producing at OX. It then increases its output by X plus one. And we're asked to find out the marginal revenue. So what's the increase? Well, by producing X plus one and selling at that point, this price here, we're clearly gaining the area of what? W. But why isn't the answer W only? Well, simply because the increase, so we're looking at marginal revenue, look at the increase. The increase in revenue is clearly that. We also have to take into account that by selling an extra unit, we are losing this area of revenue V. Remember, total revenue is now Z plus W, whereas before it was Z plus V. So whilst they've gained W there, they've also lost V. So the area of marginal revenue has to be this bigger W minus V. A lot of you might have just put W only, but by looking at what actually constitutes total revenue of this situation, Z plus W, and what previously constituted Z plus V, it's clear that we've lost that area there too. And that would help you get the right answer in that situation. Question 12. The diagram shows the cost and revenue curves for the production of a textbook. And which price here would maximize the publisher's revenue from the book? So we're looking for revenue maximization, so where the most units are sold. And that's going to occur, or or, sorry, you get the most revenue. And that's going to occur when marginal revenue equals zero. So this point here, we can see the marginal revenue curve hits hits rock bottom, hits zero there, is going to correspond to that point there on the uh, uh, on the price. Why is it there? Well, the reason being that every unit sold up to this point increases revenue. The marginal revenue from that unit is positive. So we're going to be increasing total revenue at that point. Where marginal revenue go below, goes below zero, that means that for every unit extra sold, the revenue you're getting is negative. You're losing money on it. People actually aren't paying for it. You have to pay them to take it. Realistically, that's never going to happen. But in theory, if you were to produce beyond that point, you wouldn't actually be making money. You'd have to pay people to take your product. You'd be losing revenue. So maximum, re- maximum revenue is the point up until which every customer who's willing to pay every unit that you're sold is going to make you positive revenue is sold when MR equals zero. So therefore, we're going to be at this point here. Question 13. Right, let's go. We managed to get it all in one thing. Good. The diagram here we've got showing cost and revenue curves of monopolistically competitive firm in the long run. Equilibrium. Here we go. Which name is correctly described the performance of this firm? So is it operating with excess capacity? Well, we're assuming it's it's um, it's monopolistically competitive, so it's going to be profit maximizing. Remember, it's a long run equilibrium, and long run equilibrium is here, where so we're going to be producing where MR equals MC. Yeah, that's our profit maximization point. Sorry, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue is here. So we know that we've got excess capacity there. Do we have? Ex- are we exploiting economies of scale? No, because air, we can increase our output. And we could still make positive units. We could still get revenue from that. But therefore, we're not going to be exploiting our economies of scale there. Quite a tricky question, one I'm happy to go over a little bit more. Question 14. Oh, let's see if we can get it all on one page and see if we go. In the diagram here, D, the demand curve for cigarettes, S is the supply curve, and MSC is the marginal social cost curve. In the introduction of a specific tax, causes the supply curve shift to S1, so we can see we've got the shift. What are likely impacts on the tax of the economic efficiency and the tax system? So what do we know? Well, we've got a complete and parallel shift here. That means that it's a specific level. It's a specific tax. Uh, we've been told it's a specific tax. And we know that specific taxes are regressive. That is, they're a set amount, meaning that they affect those with lower incomes more because they represent a greater proportion of poorer people's income. 
Well, what's going on with economic efficiency? Well, we know we're reducing the externality because we're moving closer to the marginal social cost curve. So we're charging a higher price and reducing quantity. Remember, optimal social quantity be here, where marginal social cost is a level with demand. So we're getting close to that. So we are getting more economically efficient there. So the answer is B. Question 15. Which combination of policy changes here is most likely to redistribute income from richest households to poorest households in the economy? What are excise duties? Well, excise duties are cost paid on exports. Um, they're more likely to kind of, they're likely to decrease. A de- sorry, so we're looking at whether it's so a decrease in excise duties. Well, a decrease in excise duties probably isn't going to redistribute income that much. Um, but we can say, well, if we're exporting, it's, it costs less to export, then domestic firms might be making more money, so you might get some kind of redistribution. Means tested benefits. This is going to be a really important one here. And we're not really going to care too much about excise duties. What we are really going to care about is these means tested benefits. Means tested benefits are benefits given to people based on their lowest incomes. So based on income. So we assess people's income, we means test them, that's called, cool, and then we give them benefits if they're, if they're poor. So here, if we increase means tested benefits, that's a clearly redistributive. We're taking money from the tax system and giving it to the poor. We'll hear about universal benefits. Well, universal benefits are given to everyone. They might be things like, imagine you paid something, we pay the winter fuel allowance, okay? So we give everyone over the age of 75 a winter fuel allowance, even if they're really rich, even if they're really poor. If you're a millionaire, someone like Alan Sugar, you still get a winter fuel allowance. You might not take it, but you get it. So if we're decreasing universal benefits, that is the money given to everyone, and making sure that money goes to the poorest people in the population, it's really going to be that combination here, the mean increase in means test benefits and decrease in universal benefits that are likely to kind of have this redistribution of income effect. Question 16 here. In order to reduce milk production, all producers are given, all producers are given a quota, which limits the amount of milk each producer is allowed to produce. Quotas can't be traded initially, that we're told that. So what will be the effect of the total volume of milk production and on the overall profits of milk producers if they're allowed to trade the quotas among themselves? So what this is, is kind of like, this is often applied to the environment, but you have kind of tradable quotas on emissions. So here, if you're a company that really wants to produce a lot more, but the quote you want to produce over the quota, and there's another milk company that produces under the quota, as the company wants to produce under the quota, you can then go and sell some of your slack spare capacity to the firm that wants to produce over the quota, so you can kind of trade. And what does that do on total volume? Well, we're just letting them trade, right? So firms, firms are just allowed to kind of like give out different bits of quota from their lot to others. So the effect on the total volume is not being changed. We're not changing the quota. But on profits, we're increasing because we're now allowing firms that really want to produce more and that will therefore make more profits to do so. And firms that uh, kind of need to produce less and don't want to produce as much to also make profits and do so. So we're going to see an increase in profits here. So that's a pretty standard question about quotas and one that's pretty important to understand. Question 17 here. During the year, a country's national income in money terms increases by 5%, prices increases by 4%, and the total population increases by 2%. What's the approximate change? Well, here we're able to see that if we did um, <coughs> 4 so this price in price increase, we're looking at the increase in real income. The national income in, re, in money terms increases by five, but price increased by four. So we got a real increase by one percent. But the population increased by two percent. Because five, we've got an incre- actual increase in money terms, but price is increasing. So we've only got an increase really of one percent there. Five minus four is one. And then the population's increased by two minus two percent. When up at my, we're at minus one percent. Therefore, we've got a decrease in real income ahead of one percent. Just making sure we get those figures the right way around is really important in that answer. Question 18, which of these represents an injection? It's pretty easy. The government budget deficit is definitely an injection. So it means the government is spending more and borrowing more or spending more and taxing or, or and taxing a little bit more, more likely borrowing, or that the government is spending more. Oh, sorry, or the government is simply taxing less and not changing their spending. So all of those are injections into the economy sector. There's an increase in spending or reduction in taxes that increases the government creates a budget, uh, government budget deficit, sorry. Right, question 19 is a question that um, I was asked to go over uh, by Annabelle. And it's one that has caused a lot of problems. And I actually spoke to a friend about this today because I don't think the answer here is right and I haven't worked out a way to work out why the answer that they've given us in the masking is right. I get the answer is 0.2 as A. 
And I'll explain my logic. Well, what we know is we know that income equals Y plus I plus C plus G because we've got no trade. It's a closed economy. We've also, sorry, we also know there's no government sector. So sorry, it's just Y equals I plus C. What we're doing is we're increasing I by a million, but then we get an increase in Y of four million, right? So what's the multiplier got to be? Well, the multiplier has got to be five. We started off with a one million injection and we got an overall increase of 500 million. So if we've got a multiplier of five, we therefore know that the multiplier equation is, is, is the multiplier is, five, is one over MPC, one over the marginal propensity to consume. So we know that five equals one over the marginal propensity to consume. And therefore the marginal propensity to consume is 0 0.2 according to my calculations. The mask scheme gives the answer as C, 0 0.8. This is something I'm going to speak to a professor about tomorrow. You're lucky that I actually haven't studied economics at university, and I'll see if I can get back to you with an answer on that. Question 20. Moving on. The income velocity of, the circu of circulation is equal to 2. If the rate of uh, the money supply is 8%, an average price level increased by 4%, what would be the change in real output? Know your equation here. Apply the equation. Plus 4%. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Good question. 21. The diagram here shows the demand curves and supply curves of loanable funds. The market is in equilibrium at point X. Here we go. What would be the new equilibrium point if there are increase in business confidence? Increase in business confidence means people want to demand more money. We've also got a reduction in the capacity to spend, save. So we've got this kind of uh, people save less, meaning they're spending more. So there's not as much loanable funds for people to have. So we've got a contraction in supply of loanable funds. If people are spending more, they're not saving as much which is the supply of loanable fund savings. Business confidence means they're demanding more, so we're now going from D2 to D3. Remember, we've also gone from S2 to S1. It's going to put us at this point B here. Question 22. What will most likely decrease a country's national output in the short run, but increase its potential for long-run growth? So an increase, decrease in level of import tariffs. So if we're stopping people import, we're likely to see a decrease in countries' national output because we're kind of allowing more imports to come in. We're not protecting our national industries as much. But in the long run, we're going to have more growth because we're going to import kind of like technology. We might import capital. So of these options, right, the decrease in the level of imports has the only one that's going to cause that short term, uh, full but long term increase. Remember, things like a decrease in the rate of immigration simply means we're going to have less people coming to the country. That's not going to help us in the short term or the long term because we need more labour to kind of grow. Uh, things like an increase in the money supply and an increase in the female participation labour force similarly won't fulfil both those criteria. 23. Which change would best indicate the country's experience in economic development? So what do, we, what do we mean when we say economic development? Well, we mean kind of increasing improvement in average citizens' quality of life. We're thinking about like countries having better healthcare, better education, etc. It's quite a straightforward question. And the answer is clearly B. Appreciation of currency, trade balances, an increase in the country's real GDP, maybe, um, is economic development. But those issues with growth, we really want to be thinking about quality of life, kind of qualitative measures that we talk about development. Question 24. The diagram shows the relationship between the rate of inflation and the rate of unemployment, sometimes called the Phillips curve. As inflation goes down, unemployment goes up. As inflation goes up, unemployment goes down. What would cause this kind of curve to shift inwards? Well, if we have a lower expected rate of inflation, right, then that's what's going to shift in, inwards. Because by shifting inflation here, we're showing that expectation is that we're not going to get as much unemployment, nor as much inflation. So previously here, where we had this high level of unemployment, high level of inflation, we're now getting less at each, at each level. So here, when we've got this much unemployment, we've got less inflation. And when we've got this much inflation, we've got this much less unemployment. You can clearly see that kind of we've got this lower expectation rate of inflation there in 24. 25, what's the best measure of economic cost of an increase in unemployment? Well, we're trying to think what happens when we have an increase in unemployment. Well, how do we measure that cost? Well, we're losing people producing stuff. That's the problem with unemployment. To get the benefits, we have to pay them as kind of a side thing. The biggest cost we've got is the fact that these were workers who were originally working in factories, uh, working in service industries, etc. But now they're not working. So we're losing their output. So the potential output that they could have produced had they been in work is what we actually really lose when they get unemployed. 
quite a straightforward question there. Question 26, this is not one that I was asked to get to. The diagram shows the actual output and expected output of an economy. So we've got actual output and expected output here. So we see that actual output is, is fluctuating. What would help this? Well, one of the reasons that we talk about the answer C, we talk about automatic stabilizers, because one of the reasons we talk about automatic stabilizers, and by reduced divergence, we mean stick closer to this expected output and not fluctuate is extremely, is that when we go below the level of expected or we have a up and kind of a bus cycle we get in a session, automatic fiscal stabilizers kick in to stabilize the economy. For example, we start paying more benefits, people then spend more and we can kind of recover a little bit. When we're in boom years, people start paying more taxes and therefore we kind of stop the boom a little bit. So we reduce this by divergence based on automatic taxes and benefit payments and tax increases that kind of come into play when um, people start, we get start getting more money in a boom or we lose start losing money in a bus cycle. So the fluctuations around here are likely to be less extreme and we're not going to get as much divergence because of these automatic stabilizers. It's basically their job in the economy. Question 27. In an economy with a fixed exchange rate, we're thinking which combination of policies is likely to be most effective at tackling both the growing current account deficit on the balance of payments and rising inflationary pressures. So we've got inflation. We want to reduce inflation. And we also want to kind of tackle a growing current account deficit. And we know that in order to tackle inflation, higher inflationary pressure, we need higher interest rates. And we also need a budget surplus in order to counter the current account. So if you differentiated those two, and looked at the only combination that works, the answer is C. Higher interest rates are going to get more people borrowing. Uh, they're going to get more people spending. They're also going to mean we'll have less likely imported inflation. Uh, the current account, uh, the budget surplus, means that we're going to be taxing more, we're going to be taking money out of the economy, and that's going to improve our growing current account deficit. Here we have 28, a table giving details of government's budget over two years. What's happened to the government finances? So. What we're seeing here is that originally the government revenue was this much and our deficit, you can clearly calculate, was about just over 1.1 billion. So the government spending, sorry, his revenue, his spending. So we can see that revenue's gone up by a lot and spending's gone up by a lot as well. But we can still see that we're still in a deficit. So we're still spending more than we ha than we could uh we still had a deficit running there. We still had a deficit running there. Whenever we're running a deficit, we're having to borrow more. So what does that tell us? Well, when we have to borrow, we've got a, we got more debt. So although the budget deficit shrunk in this period, the national debt still rose because we still had that budget deficit. Remember, every year we have a budget deficit we have to borrow. That's going to increase our government, our national debt. Question 29. In an open economy, what is most likely to cause the money supply to fall? Uh, again, a simple question, knowing what an open economy is, one where we've got trade, we think about what causes the money supply. So we're looking for something that is going to be kind of important about the amount of notes going out of the economy, not so much money supply uh, abroad, but money supply domestically. Well, an increase in the ratio of cash reserves to total job deposits, what they are is that we have more money on tap uh, and total deposits, the amount we really put in the bank. So. The money supply falling is going to be an increase in this ratio of cash reserves. So we're holding more money back uh, in the in the banking sector. And that's going to uh, reduce our money supply. We're putting less money out circulating the economy. Finally, question 30. A government responds to a fall in national income by increasing its spending. And it finances this increased spending by issuing bonds to the non-bank private sector. What is likely to be one of the consequences of this policy? Well, we're likely to see a crowding out of investment, private investment. What is private crowding out of private investment? It's where the government drives up interest rates, meaning that um, private investors can't really borrow. It's too expensive. So government responds to this fall in national income by increasing its spending. When it, incre it borrows more and it issues more bonds to the non-bank sector, uh, it drives up those interest rates. And that's what's going to crowd out the private investment. So crowding out occurs when interest rates increase and uh, Private uh, borrowing is more expensive and therefore they don't do it. So that's uh, quite a simple quick run through of that paper. Uh, I hope that was helpful. I touched on some of the issues that you were trying to get at in your uh, questions, Annabelle. And I look forward to speaking to you guys again tomorrow.